Hey everyone, today we are joined by a comedian, combat sports commentator who has worked with Championship Wrestling from Hollywood and WWE with NXT and 205 Live, who happens to be one of the most underrated commentators in the industry, in my opinion. He's the current lead play-by-play for Titan FC on UFC Fight Pass and Undisputed Promotions in the boxing world. He can be seen and heard weekly on Championship Wrestling with the United Wrestling Network. Johnny, thank you so much for joining us. What up, Ken? I hope everything's good. And man, I thank you for the kind introduction. I truly appreciate those words, man. Thank you. No, of course. Uh, hope you had a nice Thanksgiving. As of when we are recording this, it's the day after. So I hope you had a good holiday. Yeah, I mean, doing this is making me avoid Black Friday shopping and all the madness that's <laughs> that's happening. But no, it was a great holiday with the family. And it's going to be a fun day. Got a basketball game coming up in a little bit uh, for, for the uh, middle daughter. We're, we're a modern family in every sense of the word. We're a blended family now. And so um it's it's gonna be a really cool chill weekend so i said you know why not why not just talk wrestling for a while let, let me go out here by myself talk wrestling with someone else who loves it and uh and see what comes out of it that's awesome and you know i do want to hit the plugs early we're gonna hit them at the end also but where can people follow you what do you want people to check out just so you know people watching in the beginning of the full length video they know what to look at yeah, because people tune out in like 27 seconds these days. It's pretty <laughs> – it's funny because uh, when my special – my comedy special came out last year, I talked to a friend at Netflix, and he said, uh, he said, you know, um, our, our analytics show that unless a comedian is hitting the stage and talking into a microphone in the first whatever 30 seconds, an audience will tune out. I said, cool. I don't want that audience. <laughs> I'd rather That's have, nuts. It's insane because I, my, my special has a four-minute sketch. That kind of teaches, not teaches, it shows you who I am. Because I figured most people watching my special will have no clue who I am. So I want to show them by the time I hit the stage, I want them to know. And it's like a really fun four-minute sketch. People really enjoyed it. And he's like, yeah, man, if uh, if Netflix did pick up your special, they would immediately make you cut that. And I'm like, cool, I'm just going to not be on Netflix then. I appreciate that. But anyways, uh, social media, real simple. Jay Quasto everywhere. It's JQU. A S T O. And I think on Facebook, I think I might just be Quasto, I believe. Uh, but other than that, yeah, pretty simple stuff. Uh, if you want to watch my special, it's called physical therapy because I am a physical therapist. So talks a lot about my life um, in the, the weirdest way possible between, uh, you know, being a comic and a healthcare professional and obviously what I do here. And so you can watch it on Roku, on Tubi, a bunch of other platforms. I also just shot a special with dry bar comedy, uh, who is a, a massive company that uh, they do clean, super clean comedy specials. So I have one of them coming out in the next few months. And obviously uh, I'm the lead play-by-play -play commentator for Titan Fighting Championship. You could watch them on UFC Fight Pass. We just had an event last weekend and we have a brand new one coming out. Titan FC 81 from the Dominican Republic two weeks from today. I don't know when this will be out, but it's going to be uh, Friday, December 9th. And I also am the lead play-by-play -play commentator for Undisputed Boxing Promotions, uh, pay-per-views on Fight TV, and still working in wrestling as much as humanly possible. Every single week on Championship Wrestling presented by Car Shield. Uh, check your local listings. You might have it in your city. If not, you could watch anywhere on YouTube as well as Fight TV. Championship Wrestling, it's my home. It's where I started. And I, if you love wrestling and you don't want to have to sit through hours upon hours of wrestling, simple. One hour or less. You're going to get your stories. You're going to get your matches. You're going to get some amazing talent. So I uh, couldn't recommend that more highly as well. You know, it, it amazes me how much you do because I was familiar with you from Championship Wrestling from Hollywood, WWE. I'm not the biggest mixed martial arts fan, so I didn't even know really that you were in that world. But mm. so the fact that you're doing that boxing, I knew the comedy, the comedy, which is great. And you're a physical therapist. It's, it's crazy. You're just diving into basically every avenue possible. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I'm one of those people that um, I, I I've loved so many different things. And, you know, coming up when you start chasing a dream, most people say most people that are more experienced, you say, yeah, just pick one thing and stick to it and just get great at it. And I'm like, yeah, but I only live once on Earth. So I want to be great at a lot of things, you know. And at that point, I already knew as much as I love physical therapy, I knew that wasn't my end game. I appreciate physical therapy because it got me, it allowed me to live comfortably while chasing all these various dreams. But I'm finally at the point now where I'm not doing active physical therapy anymore. If, if I have a friend who's hurt, I'll help him for free. I've lost count of how many wrestlers I've helped over the years with free PT just because I love doing it. But for me, it's like I've had so many different passions in my life. And when an opportunity comes up, I just don't want to say no. And it, it, it's a more difficult balance now having a family for sure. 
But, uh, you know, when the pandemic hit and the world came crashing down for all of us, a lot of us had to reinvent ourselves. You know, the the dream job that I had was gone in a flash. And when I say a flash, I'm talking within two hours of filming on camera and then finding out it was all over. Wow. And and so, oh, yeah. And and so for me, and, and I couldn't, um, there was nothing. Stand-up comedy was dead at the time. Sports were essentially dead at the time. Uh, sports entertainment was essentially not, it was struggling. And yeah. so- I didn't know what to do. And so that's when I had to reinvent myself. And that's where I, I found the world of, I was already doing voiceovers, but I was only doing it through an agent. I found the world of freelance voiceovers. And, uh, you know, I said, well, I just had a job with the biggest sports entertainment company in the world. I learned so much. Why can't I do it anywhere else? And that's when I said, you know what? Um, I've always wanted to do it in other sports. So let's try that out. And, you know, during the pandemic, we all had time on our hands. I'm the kind of person I don't like sitting still. I don't Netflix and chill. I don't binge watch anything. I need to be working on something all the time. And so that's kind of where I just, you know, I, I could sit around and feel sorry for myself, which I did for about eight to 10 hours. <laughs> and then I said, all right, it's it's time to get moving. I got I got a life to live. And uh, and that's kind of what I did. And now it's it's very, every week is different. Some weeks I get to be home. And I got this voiceover booth right behind me, this soundproof monstrosity that I get to work from or other days I'm traveling for Titan or for Undisputed or for wrestling. And so um, and then obviously for stand up as well, whether it's a cruise ship or whether it's a club, it's kind of a, a different thing every week. And it just keeps you it keeps you sharp when you have to be, you know, skilled on so many different levels. Yeah, that's very cool. And, you know, it's got to keep everything fresh too, right? Because, you know, sometimes if you do the same thing over and over, it can grow monotonous, even something you love. Even I can imagine because comedy and wrestling are a little different because the entertainment industry is always changing and, you know, probably the same with sports. But, you know, physical therapy, I can imagine as much as you liked it, it can grow a little monotonous at times. So it's good that you have it mixed up. Now, speaking of the physical therapy, we did interview Joe Galley just a couple days ago. And yeah. I know I found out he's a good friend of yours, which I didn't know ahead of time. Oh, yeah. Um, He brought up how your physical therapy knowledge helps you with commentary and professional wrestling. Does it also help in the world of mixed martial arts and boxing? Because you understand the body and the human anatomy better or... Yeah, without question. First off, love Joe. Him and I were broadcast partners for, I got to say, about three years consecutively uh, with championship wrestling before, you know, he went his way with NWA and then I went my way to Florida with WWE. But no, we've stayed very good friends. We chat all the time, text each other random stuff all the time. Uh, very proud of all the work he's done. Uh, you talk about multitasking. I mean, look at Joe's life, you know, working full time in news and then sneaking away to do wrestling for a long time. <laughs> I mean, I was, I was working with him when his one news station had no idea he was working in wrestling, you know, so very happy for him. Very proud of him. He's also newly engaged, which is awesome. So, oh uh, yeah, there's no question about it. That's why like, you know, I don't think there's any commentator out there with my exact skill set. That doesn't mean I'm better than anybody else. I'm just saying there isn't anybody with what I have in my brain. On, on top of the 15 years in stand-up, being able to handle any situation on the spot, I have a master's degree in physical therapy. Wow. Like my, my master's degree is in the body. So sure, it worked in wrestling, but absolutely it works in MMA or boxing. The thing is being a play-by-play -play guy though, I have to call the action first. If we have some time, I can get into what could be happening with a Kimura lock or something like that, or you know whether it be an arm bar, you, know, you could talk about how it could tear the labrum or the, or the different muscles of the rotator cuff. And I love bringing that into my storytelling and wrestling because, you know, submission submissions have become more and more popular over the last 10 to 15 years, especially in wrestling. And, mm -hmm. and so, yeah, that's a big part of, of what I think uh, storytelling needs to be, not just, oh, it's this hold. Well, what does the hold do? But that's the thing is most play-by-play -play guys, they can't give you an expertise on that. They can take a guess. Like I've heard commentators say, oh, and he's prone on the mat when the guy's laying on his back. No, no, no. Prone is on your stomach. Supine's on your back. Like little things like that where I'm just like sitting there going, mm, you know, that that's, that's not quite right. But, you know, I can't blame them. They don't have a master's degree in physical therapy. <laughs> so yeah. I try my best to bring in that expertise, but I don't try to like hit you over the head with it. I just want to. You know, I want to make sure the viewer has a complete understanding of what they're seeing. And I'm grateful 
for physical therapy to, to give me that. Yeah. When I was talking to Joe and he was bringing that up, he mentioned, you know, your knowledge of it and your expertise on it. And it just made me think instantly. So you're not doing gorilla monsoonisms, you know, with the various body parts that he would mention that don't actually exist. You mean the <laughs> bread basket? I love the bread basket. I, Fantastic. Gorilla, gorilla was my hero. Uh, as far as commentary teams, as a little kid, Gorilla, Monsoon, and Bobby Heenan. Oh, boy. I mean, I could watch them. I still do. I go back and watch all their clips, whether it be, you know, uh, Tuesday Night Titans or watch the little sketches they did where Heenan left a, a bunch of banana peels <laughs> for Gorilla when they were out in the woods. I mean, they, you talk about classic duos who didn't even have to try to be great. That's what they were. There was such an authenticity to Gorilla. Uh, being just the, um, you know, protecting the baby face and just being just the the good hearted voice. And then there was Bobby Heenan who could get one over on a lady in church. You know yeah. what I mean? And, and so, um, yeah, by no means would I ever want to interpret or uh, or do impressions of any other commentator. But, you know, I certainly learn and appreciate uh, from listening to him. No, absolutely. They were great. Weasel was the perfect nickname for Bobby the Brain Heenan's character. Yeah. And, you know, I'm I'm 31 years old, so I grew up just the generation after them. But of course, you know, I've watched everything they've done. You know, sure. I came up in the King and JR era and then so on and so forth. Maybe a little before that, the new generation, the Vince, mm -hmm. you know, and that was entertaining. But so you were a fan as a kid. Uh, how did you first discover wrestling? Who was your favorite growing up? When did you decide you wanted to be involved in the business in some way? Uh, I started watching when Wrestling Challenge and Superstars started airing, at least from to my recollection. Uh, some of my earliest memories involved pro wrestling, whether it be, from what I remember, Saturday mornings you had Superstars at 10 to 11, and then Wrestling Challenge 11 to 12. I might be off. Maybe it was 9 to 10, 10 to 11, but it was like a two-hour block. And me and my oldest friend in life, we met in like nursery school. Every Saturday morning, I'd be over at his house and we'd be watching. Like I still have the disclaimer memorized in my brain. And of course, we would be imitating everything. We destroyed like three of his Ottomans in the basement, you know? <laughs> and so that was my earliest memories. My very first live event, I don't know the exact date. I think it was 1987. Uh, it was the Allentown Fairgrounds in the Lehigh Valley, Pennsylvania. The main event, I remember it being uh, Junkyard Dog and Outlaw Ron Bass. What I don't remember, my friend had to remind me because his stepdad took us. Apparently, that main event only lasted about two minutes, and that was the main. I just remember just the grandiose uh, display and keep in mind this is the Allentown Fairgrounds there were no bells and whistles it was just as a little kid just being there and seeing these larger than life athletes was amazing to me and I don't even remember the main event going two minutes he did he had to remind me of that I'm like I don't know I just thought it was awesome but I remember that was the main event of the first show I ever went to and I did find the flyer for it online recently which I thought was really cool yeah that is very cool and you know back then especially People weren't so hyper focused on, you know, we need 15, 20 minutes for this to be a match of the year, like a lot of fans are conditioned to today. But also, personally, I'm of the belief that occasionally having a quick main event, it shakes everything up. Because if you had like Brock Lesnar and Goldberg in 2016, they had like a two minute, three minute main event. Then mm -hmm. suddenly, every time someone hit a spear in the first two minutes, it was a credible potential near fall which I love. I love that aspect of professional wrestling. So when did you decide you were going to get involved in the business? And at what point in your life were you deciding this? Cause obviously you became a commentator, but did you ever want to be a professional wrestler itself? Like how did that journey start for you? I, I think every kid at one point you're like, yeah, I'm going to grow up and be a professional wrestler, but the, the amount of dedication and belief in yourself and, and also outside the box thinking like, yes, I grew up in the Lehigh Valley, which is a haven for pro wrestling. I mean, the wild Samoans had their wrestling school right next to the bowling alley where my mom went bowling in Whitehall, Pennsylvania. You know, I never got a chance to go in cause I was too little. And just the fact that I'm now good friends with Rikishi blows my mind. And I, I did a short comedy tour with him right before I, I went to WWE. It's just, it, the, the things that you don't expect in life are crazy. Um, so yeah, I mean, Lehigh Valley is a haven for professional wrestling, Pennsylvania as a whole, it is. Uh, but I just, it was one of the things I never thought would be possible, 
by any stretch of the imagination, you know, and, and once I graduated high school, I, I had to figure out something, what am I going to do with my life? What am I going to major in? And I, you know, my mom and dad were both nurses. And so they said, well, you love sports. Why don't you try physical therapy? Which I did. And it wasn't until I graduated that, uh, you know, I, like a lot of comics went through a breakup, almost moved across the country for this person, uh, realized it was not a good idea. And I looked up comedy classes, started doing stand up in 2005. And pretty much I'm one of those people that if I, I can't half ass it, if, if I'm not going to go all in, I'm just not going to do it. So after about a year or so, I started really getting into it, getting up almost every single night. And then I kind of fell into my first hosting gig through stand up with uh, CBS mobile. This is like right when mobile content started happening on phones and it was a stand-up comedy contest that I won. And then I got my first hosting job. So I learned on the fly how to read a teleprompter and how to be a host. And it kind of just came natural to me, just, you know, treating the camera like it was your audience at home. And it was a lot of fun. And fast forward to another year or two, I was working on another hosting gig. And me and the camera guy were just talking wrestling. I don't know how it came up. And little did I know, he was close with David Marquez. He was David's main camera guy. So a couple months later, I get contacted by David Marquez and he said, hey, uh, I'd love to meet for a coffee. If you don't mind, I want to talk to you about a professional wrestling project. And I was like, oh, this will be interesting. Did you live in California at this point or were you still in Pennsylvania? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I moved to California in late 2004. So I was, you know, hustling around there, doing stand up, doing hosting, stuff like that. But even as an adult, I never thought I, I never even thought professional wrestling would be an option. It's just that that as much as I loved it, I mean, I, I just never thought I'd be able to find a way in, you know, never expected it. And we sat down. He said, hey, uh, I'm starting weekly professional wrestling television in Los Angeles. Um, you know, my camera guy speaks very highly of you and I, I need someone to do interviews. He said, I, I can't promise anything's going to come out of it, but it's an opportunity. And I said, yeah, I'm in before I even sat down. I, if it was pro wrestling related, I'm like, yes, I'm going to I'm going to say yes to this. I remember our first taping, my very first interview ever was with uh, the NWA champion at the time, Scrap Iron Adam Pierce. Now, very cool, very close friend. I, I consider him to be one of the main reasons I was hired with WWE. So I, I, I still owe a lot to him. I always told him anytime you're in my presence, you're never going to pay for a drink. And I've held up up that end of the bargain ever since. And so you know, over the course of nine years with Championship Wrestling, you know, I was doing interviews. And then one day I got kind of thrown into commentary, never having do it, uh, never having done it before. This is probably about seven or eight years ago, I think at least. And oh my God, it's like a light bulb went off. And it it just felt so natural to me to to tell the stories of the guys and girls in the ring that were competing and just trying to make it sound as much as I, I could like a sport and just do my own version of it, you know? And so thanks to championship wrestling, I had the option to do, ev I did everything with a microphone before I even got to WWE. And that's why one of the reasons I think I got hired without an audition <laughs> because yeah. I had a really large body of work. I had just been to Pakistan in uh, late 2018 for the second time. Uh, as a group of people who brought uh, professional wrestling to Pakistan, live pro wrestling for the first time ever oh, with wow. a, an amazing company called Ring of Pakistan. They're actually about to do something huge over there now again, which I'm very happy for them. So, I mean, I had already done quite a bit in pro wrestling and I always took it very seriously. Like I've always separated stand up and wrestling. To me, they're, I don't really mess with them. You know, like to me as a play-by-play -play guy, like, I'm serious about what I do. Stand up is completely separate, you know? Um, and so it, it's pretty crazy. Like if it wasn't for meeting David Marquez, none of this ever would have happened. You know, I never would have had the dream gig, never would have ended up working in MMA on UFC fight pass, never would have ended up calling boxing. So many things would be completely different about my life. If I, if I didn't take, that coffee meeting with David and just saying, yeah, I'm in a hundred percent. And I was, you know, loyal to championship wrestling over those nine years. I did everything possible behind the scenes, everything possible with the microphone. And now that I'm back in California, it felt, it feels great to go back home. Uh, now I'm basically the, uh, the on-screen authority figure, if you will, uh, for the committee for the United wrestling network. And I take that very seriously because I, I don't think it's done well um, over the years for, by a lot of people. 
And so for me, it's like, I want it to be believable. I want it to be realistic and I want it to be as sports-based as possible. And so that's been another awesome thing that I never thought I'd be able to do. And, and now I'm doing that as well. So uh, hopefully that wasn't too long of an answer, but it's no, been a weird perfect. journey. <laughs> as you know, I, I believe I mentioned this to you. I much prefer getting granular. Like I'd rather, you know, I sent you a big list of questions. I'd rather get to half of the questions, mm. but answer them thoroughly and, you know, maybe do a part two one day. Then just rush through them all with, yeah, you know, it was pretty cool. <laughs> but Part two coming up. <laughs> but, you know, David Marquez, I think he, I mean, I wouldn't say he's underrated because I think a lot of people speak highly of him in the industry. But I yeah. do think not enough people talk about his influence on so many people and helping mm -hmm. so many careers. And you mentioned how, you know, Championship Wrestling from Hollywood helped you in all those different avenues. They have such a professional setup. You oh, know, yeah. the, they really are in a lot of ways just a smaller version of the big companies. You know what I mean? A lot of indie companies, they're just put on a wrestling show. But oh, yeah. his is like a real professional program. And I respect that quite a bit. No question. I mean, David Marquez and, and his work is so underappreciated and, um, underestimated and not given enough respect over the years. I mean, it's, it's the experience that I got, I learned on the job and so many other people do. It's, it's very difficult, especially as a wrestler to learn how to work television. And you do not have that many options on the indie scene. Like, yeah, you might do an indie show that has one hard cam. Guess what? That doesn't help you at all. That's just, you work in a match and you're working to the crowd. But to have multiple multiple roving cameras running around the ring, that's a, a very difficult skill to learn. You know, yeah. um, like I remember uh, David telling me a story when when Drew Gulak went to to WWE, he got a lot of praise uh, during the Cruiserweight Classic for knowing how to work TV. And he goes, "Yeah, because I just got done with Championship Wrestling for the past two years. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I learned how to do that. And look at Drew today, still." Yeah gainfully employed and he's an amazing brilliant wrestling mind and uh, of course he's a pennsylvanian i mean we all just think alike of know? course absolutely <laughs> but no david uh i like i said i i don't think enough people appreciate where they come from not just in wrestling i think in any kind of entertainment you know um i think it happens with stand-up i think it happens in a lot of in a lot of facets of entertainment and sports and so i always make sure that you know when i had a chance to when I moved back to California, I just reached out. And I said, hey, I don't know what you need. I said, I would just love to show up. I'm like, if you if you want help backstage, if you want help, uh, you know, I could help people with promos, whatever you need. I just want to be there because I, I, I miss it and I appreciate everything that I did beforehand. And so fortunately, it worked out to where there was a role for me and in, in, uh, in multiple, you know, backstage roles and everything like that. So it's been a lot of fun to to be back there. But yeah, I mean, the product has truly been special over so many years now. We've been on television weekly for, it started back in 2010. And even before that, there were different versions of it mm -hmm. before I had a chance to be involved. It was the showcase and stuff like that. And initially it was NWA championship wrestling, but now it's championship wrestling presented by car shield. And it's one show that airs all throughout the country and talent come in from all over the country. And I'll tell you what, man, we're telling great stories. I mean, there's, Tremendous talent. We have an event coming up Sunday, December 11th. Uh, Danny Limelight's going to finally have his opportunity to challenge for the United World Championship uh, being held by Jordan Clearwater. And you talk about a guy who has grown, both of them, separate stories, but the growth. I mean, I remember when Jordan, I believe he was trained by Carl Anderson, and Carl sent him to Dave about five years ago. And Jordan came in very new to championship wrestling. And the growth over the past five years, it is a different person, not only in size, just in persona, in the aura he brings when he walks in a room. I'll tell you what, man, I it, it that's what makes me so happy working in wrestling is when you see people progress and you see them get it. And Jordan, I can't speak more highly of his mind like he listens to advice. Anything you tell him, he'll he'll sink in and he'll use it. And you look at what he's doing now, I think the sky's the limit. And look, Danny's got a totally different story. I think Danny's been fire on the mic for years. I mean, he was um, four or five years ago, uh, before I went WWE, he was part of a tag team and they were fantastic. 
and then he formed the bodega and then he worked for a couple different promotions and you know he's the, the the reaction he gets from the fans in southern california is truly authentic and it's amazing so this match is going to be a lot of fun and that's happening sunday december 11th at the improv in irvine and obviously it will be airing on television as well but uh, just, you know, if you're not watching championship wrestling and, and you're a fan who just wants to see uh, wrestling with good storytelling, it, you can't go wrong. So I, I couldn't recommend it more highly. Yeah, definitely get on that. And, you know, I've known Jordan Clearwater. Well, I haven't known him. I've known of his work for several years through uh, the NWA as well. And you were spot on his improvement in not just his improvement in the ring, but on the microphone and his body is improved tremendously i've never someone who's ever been in shape but he he is in phenomenal shape yeah. like truly he's also phenomenal shape. he's also a joy to be around there i've had amazing spirit experiences in wrestling i mean i've made i'll be honest i think i've made closer friends in wrestling than i have in stand-up and i think that's because i think wrestling you have to work with people or you're not going to be successful as a comic, you can be a ruthless prick and still be successful. You may burn some bridges along the way. And trust me, that has happened for some comics. Mm -hmm. But you could still be successful. If you cannot work well with people in wrestling, your shelf life is going to be pretty short. So that's why I think that's why I think I've made better friends in wrestling than I have in stand-up, just because I think there's a mutual appreciation. There's more of a respect level in wrestling, you know, for for what everyone does, whether it's behind the scenes or in front of the camera. And so there, but there are some people that are just a joy to be around and Clearwater is definitely one of them. Uh, Danny and I also have a very strong relationship. So it's going to be, it's going to be hard for me on December 11th as essentially the person who helped put this match together uh, to, to, you know, no matter what, it's going to be a great match. I don't know who the champion is going to be at the end of it, but the fans are definitely going to be really excited for it. So yeah, but I owe everything to championship wrestling. I never would have had that opportunity uh, to go to WWE. That seven-year-old me still doesn't believe actually happened. <laughs> if it wasn't for championship wrestling. Fantastic. And you know, maybe I'll have to interview Jordan Clearwater in the future. So you brought up WWE and this is a good time to get on to it. You said you thought Adam Pierce was potentially your gateway into the company. What happened exactly? Who contacted you? Who reached out? How did that start? I mean, I, I truly don't know what happened behind the scenes, but if, if I had to guess the two people that had the biggest influence were, were Adam Pierce and Nigel McGinnis. Nigel and I were also very close friends for years before I went there. Um, but basically what happened was uh, I was initially contacted um, by Tom Hannafin, who's now lead play-by-play -play guy for Impact, him and Matthew Raywalt, incredible team, phenomenal. They're great. And he said, uh, hey, you know, um, we may have an opening for, actually he said we may have an opening for Evolve. Would you be, which I, th I thought that was interesting because, I knew Lenny Leonard was, and Lenny's one of the most underappreciated, uh, amazing play-by-play -play guys in the game. I love Lenny, and he's such a kind person. And, you know, one thing I would still love to do is call an event with him. I've never had a chance to do it. We've become friends, but we have not had a chance to work together. I hope someday we can do that. And so I was like, well, I, okay, whatever the opening might be. So maybe they were looking for a partner for Lenny. I really don't know. And so I, I sent in some footage. Actually, I remember what happened was my car was broken into two days before he contacted me. I was actually calling a wrestling event and someone smashed two of my windows and stole my computer bag. Like an idiot, I didn't put my bag, I didn't bring the bag in because it was going to be a crowded event and I didn't put my bag in my trunk. Oh. I put it in the back seat like a moron. And my computer was stolen and my hard drive was stolen. Ooh. And so I said, hey, uh, my car just got broken into. Can you give me 48 hours so I can try to gather my footage? So credit to Ring of Pakistan. I contacted them. I said, hey, can you send me footage of me hosting and ring announcing and doing all this stuff in front of the arena? But oh, okay, sure, sure. They sent it over, thank God. And I had uh, other footage and put it together. And so I was able to send it. And then um, a couple of weeks later, he reached out again. He, he said, hey, uh, actually, we're interested in maybe bringing you in as part of our team, which blew my mind. I was like, oh, my God, okay. And he said, would you be interested? I said, yep. He goes, okay, uh, we'll be in touch again. Okay. And then uh, this was probably like early March. And I knew it was a crazy time of year because that's always WrestleMania season. So I didn't know what to expect. And I'll never forget, I was uh, it was a Wednesday, third week of March. And I was uh, working at, uh, still working at a hospital in downtown LA, um, running around in my scrubs on very little sleep as per usual. 
And I was about to go into a patient room and I feel my phone vibrating in my pocket. And I look down and I see it was Tom calling me. And I was like, oh, keep in mind, this is a very old hospital. So it's it's hard to get, find a spot with good reception. So I quick ran in another direction and went near the window and answered the phone call. And uh, and I was like, hello. He's like, hey, Johnny, it's Tom. I said, Tom, nice to meet you. Or nice, nice to talk to you again. He goes, uh, I have a question for you. I said, I hope I have an answer. He said, how would you like to work for WWE? And I said, uh, are you pranking me? <laughs> and he started laughing. He said, no, man. He said, um, you know, usually we wouldn't hire anyone without an audition, but everyone here who knows you speaks so highly of you. Plus the work I've seen speaks for itself. We need a utility guy. We need a guy who could do everything with a microphone and you fit the bill. We don't feel there's a need to fly you across the country to audition. We just think that you're worth taking a chance on. And so would you like to start, you know, after WrestleMania? I said, oh my God, let's go. You know, they, so they gave me a month to get my my move straightened out, my life straightened out. I didn't tell anybody. Uh, I remember it leaked on, on the internet like a week before. Not like it's a big deal because wrestling fans don't care if a commentator gets hired, but I just thought it was funny that it did leak. Uh, but I didn't tell anybody. I had a small gathering of like eight to 10 friends before the night before I moved. And that was it. And then I moved to Florida. And two years later, there were still people who didn't realize I ever lived in Florida. <laughs> That's wild. That's it wild. Was. What a cool experience, though. And did you go on to work a lot with Tom? Like, was he the lead producer for a lot of what you did? Who would, who would often produce you in NXT? Dude, that's the funny thing. So when I was at the PC, I didn't have any other commentators there, you know, because uh, uh, Vic was essentially at the time out of the area. Tom had moved back home towards Philly and Byron did live in Florida, but Byron was, was on Raw, SmackDown, you know how busy he was yeah. at the time. So I actually had nobody to call matches with. So I had to just start asking the talents. I would pull them into the the booth. commentary booth. Yeah, there was a, a nice it, it the booth switched around. It used to be a tiny room in the beginning, and then they switched things around to where it became a bigger room over in like the other warehouse at the PC. And the people that did the commentary with me the most would be uh, you know, Brennan Williams, aka now he's Masse, um, Mansoor, and uh Daddy Magic, who's now with AEW, those three guys would almost always say yes. And there'd be a few other people as well who'd want to come in. Um, like, uh, you know, Chelsea Green hopped in with me a few times and she's hilarious. Um, Cesar Benoni uh, wanted to learn how to do it in Portuguese. So he hopped in with me a little bit here and there. But the big three for me were, you know, Masse, Mansoa. <laughs> it's great <laughs> saying that. Absolutely. And, uh, and Daddy Magic, you know, and... Um, a couple times Bobby Fish actually would would help me out and he would come in too. And so it's crazy what happened there. That's how Mansoor and I ended up doing 205 Live one night because they needed a team. And that was kind of began my unfortunately short run because of the pandemic. But it was only my second broadcast ever. And it was Mansoor's first broadcast ever. And if you watch back, I thought it was pretty darn good. Like I was really mm -hmm. proud of the least experienced team ever doing this together. And it was a lot of fun. And that's actually how Brennan ended up being moved up to commentary. Yeah, uh, because, raw, right? Yeah, he was calling matches with me just to help me out. And plus, he enjoys it. I mean, he's an incredibly talented guy. Look at what he's done with all these different things that have been thrown at him. He just continues to do it in amazing form. Random thing just to plug real quick. Obviously, I have no affiliation. The Maximum Male Model skits they've been doing on YouTube every week have been fantastic, and everybody yes. should check them out. They have so much more personality than even they show, they show a bunch on TV, but even more, people should check them out and give it a chance because it's really good. I, I may or may not have provided a few ideas for some of the upcoming sketches, but yeah, they are they are fantastic, and they're they're both very good friends and I'm proud of them, you know, for everything they're, they're just running with it and it's great. And so that's actually, you know, Brennan and I were calling matches and one thing led to another Brennan, the tapes of us calling matches would get sent up and that's how he ended up going on two Oh five live and then quickly jumping up to raw. And it was crazy. I'm like, all because we were doing commentary here in the booth. He's like, yeah, yeah, I guess. And obviously he's a gorgeous man. So why would you not want him on your camera? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and, and whereas daddy magic, oh my God, what a force of nature. Yeah, he, him and Jeff Parker, uh, 
Cool Hand Ange, they they both became very good friends right away. Um, you know, guys like them, Brennan, Mansoor, Swerve, I, I got to say, like, those five guys, you never know who you're going to stay friends with after, you know, you move on. And I got to say, those five, like, I, I truly appreciate them, you know. Um, they're great, they're great human beings. And But Daddy Magic, dude, he had a lot of fun. He would love coming in the booth. Like, all right, Johnny, let's go. Let's go call this. And nothing we called could ever be broadcast. Let's just say this. I was trying to call it down the middle, and he was completely goofing off. Of like, <laughs> just saying the most politically incorrect, ridiculous, hilarious, just I was so entertained by it. But it allowed me to, you know, play off of him a lot, you know. And so if you look at him now, now I believe he's doing commentary for – you know, dark and dark elevation and stuff mm-hmm. like that because he's a personality. He gets it. He's as old school as it comes when it comes to pro wrestling, you know, and it all, you know, it all started when him and I were doing commentary together back in the booth. And now we talk and he goes, yeah, he's like, I'm just being myself on, on dark and dark elevation. And it's a lot of fun and it's incredible, you know? And so for me, I I was calling matches with, with wrestlers. I wasn't calling matches with any other commentators or any other trained color commentators. I was just staying busy and I loved it. You know, it, it was stressful at times because I, you know, I, I had to, some days I had no one to call stuff with, you know? And, um, and then there were certain TV days on NXT where uh, Beth Phoenix would come in and her and I would work on commentary together. We would work on like, transitions like vid- uh, quick little video packages or graphics on the screen and then cutting from you know a graphic to commercial and you talk about like the sweetest human being you'll ever meet that describes Beth to a T she is authentically an amazing human being and just that little time we had like an hour every Tuesday before she would go in and do TV that was a lot of fun like there's moments like that that I'll I'll never take for granted like I'm working with a hall of famer here and she's thanking me for working with her. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're helping each other out. Trust <laughs> me. I need all the help I can get. And this is an amazing thing. I'm happy to, just to be here. And so it was little stories like that. Um, just still put a smile on my face. You know, I'm, I'm very grateful for all that. So, yeah, it was a wild ride. I mean, uh, just whoever wanted to come into the booth, I would be calling matches with him. And that's pretty much how it worked. That's super cool. Now, with NXT, you were primarily an interviewer. With 205, you were doing commentary. For NXT, you were doing interviews. A lot of yep. WWE.com stuff. Um, you, I think you were there for the transition to USA Network for NXT, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, how, how was that transition, and who often produced you for doing the interviews backstage? How produced were they? Could you go into that a little bit? Uh, let's see. Yeah. Primarily I was doing the digital stuff for NXT. There was like a two or three week run where I got bumped up to TV because they didn't have anyone else to do the TV interviews. You know, it was before, um, they decided on McKenzie as, as being the main TV interviewer, but she's also great. Yeah, of course she is. She's fantastic. And what was great about that is, um, I, I, I didn't sit in on the meetings, the weekly meetings for NXT because I wasn't part of that team. But uh, a few people told me like, yeah, like when it came time to deciding to do the TV interviews, like four or five people said your name and Triple H just said, all right, if you guys feel he can do it, fine. (laughs) And luckily, every interview I did on TV for those few weeks went fantastic. I didn't have a lot. I had one with Keith Lee. I had one with William Regal, one with um, William Regal and Dakota and Raquel. um, And I forget who else. But, you know, it was nice to do that. And otherwise, it was all digital. Um, the digital ones, they happen pretty quick. It's you pretty much get an idea for what you're doing. After a while, they trusted me to come up with what I was saying. I would always make sure I'd run it by them. But for me, like my thing about backstage interviews is I want to make them realistic. Like I want to make them conversational. I don't want to. They sound so scripted in modern wrestling. They yeah. really do. And I'm not saying any one particular company. It's just how it's become. So it's for me, I always look at things from a sports aspect. I just want it to be real. I just want it to be conversational. And so that was always my goal with uh, with the backstage interviews. It does seem like, uh, in many ways, the way you're describing it, I feel like you share a vision much more in line with maybe Triple H's vision of wrestling as opposed to Vince McMahon. It's not that you don't have oh, yeah. appreciation for both. But, sure. you know, Triple H, and I can speak to this, you know, I grew up loving Vince McMahon's vision, so I'm not tearing it down by any stretch as i've gotten older i definitely have more of an appreciation for nxt 
what 205 was and what it could have been. And I could talk an hour about that because <laughs> I thought 205 Live in like 2018 and 2019, even though it was, you know, 10 o'clock on a Friday night with fans yeah. who didn't care, I thought it had one of the best rosters in the business and had some of the, like, you had like Drew Gulak, uh, Mustafa Ali, you had Buddy Murphy, you had oh, yeah. Deo Tommy, Cedric, like eventually three point or Ever Rise were included, you know, on and on and on. And I think, if they followed the cruiserweight classic strategy with 205 live, I think it could have been bigger. Uh, yeah. I, I think like, I think it needed like full sale. I think it needed to be at full sale or, you know, a small arena like that with fans who were dedicated to the show. Well, yes. I do agree with you that obviously at full sale it would have been great, but so when I was doing 205, it was in such a state of flux. I mean, it went from being, 10 o'clock on Fridays live to being taped beforehand in the arena right before SmackDown. Then to, oh gosh, when was, the, well, then obviously it went to the performance on PC it. with, with no audience. So, I mean, man, I called so many different versions of 205, but I will say my favorite without a doubt was the 10 o'clock on a Friday night after SmackDown. Sure. The arena wasn't packed but three quarters of the people still stayed. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, yeah, it was it was a little tough at times. But the beautiful thing about 205 Live when it was at 10 o'clock is the show was about 45 minutes and the guys got to work. Like yeah. you were having 15 to 18 minute matches and you you really got to tell a story and there was very minimal producing going on. Mm -hmm. You know, when I, when I would come backstage after 205, nobody was left. With the exception of, you know, Adam Pierce was in my ear. Obviously, he was still there. But not many people were there. Most people had gone home. So it, you had the guys on 205, they just got to be themselves. It was very low pressure. Even, even me, who puts tons of pressure on myself, I felt most comfortable at 10 o'clock on a Friday night, knowing that we had some time to tell some stories and just being in an arena. God almighty. There's a couple experiences I'll never forget. But the guys really got to work and tell stories because sometimes you would have as much as as 20 minutes. And then you had guys like Aria Davari who really knew how to get a crowd going as a heel. Also, and great. so, you know, it was a challenge, but you're right. It was a great roster. I wasn't there, you know, um, buddy was already gone at the time from two Oh five. Gulak was pretty much gone, but we had incredible talent there. You know, mm -hmm. we had Oni Lorcan, we had Danny Birch, we had angel Garza, Tony niece, Tony niece. This is when, and swerve, we saw the, the, yeah. the breaking out of swerve and, you know, going up to Worlds Collide in that fatal four-way match. And uh, let's see who else. Uh, Tyler Breeze was just, had just kind of returned. And I honestly thought he was on a path to become cruiserweight champion. I'm like, yeah. how cool would that be if Tyler Breeze wins his first ever title in WWE as cruiserweight? That's what I thought was going to happen. But Leo Rush was fantastic on there too. Leo Rush was champion for most of the time when I was calling it. Leo knocked it out of the park. His matches were amazing. I mean, it was a great roster who truly every week had no idea what was happening. It was very um all over the place, but I thought everyone made the most of it. And I was very proud of, you know, unfortunately, like I said, the pandemic affected things for all of us and and it was cut very short, but man, I, I appreciated every single second I got to do it. And I have a lot of pride in my work uh, from on that show. No, absolutely. And I think we made a great point where, because maybe it wasn't as overproduced, that's part of the reason why it was so good, because it felt different to Raw and SmackDown. And again, it's not that Raw and SmackDown are bad, but I think if you're going to have the different brands, they need to feel different. Yeah. Just as a fan, because if if I'm going to if I'm going to watch the Raw and SmackDown presentation, I'm going to watch it with the top stars. If I want to watch something different, I want to see people bring something different. And that's what 205 Live did. It was a wrestling show. Quite mm -hmm. simply, it was a wrestling show with great matches, incredible athletes, and some of the the best performers that you can see in a ring. And that's all, and that's what it was, and uh, it was a lot of fun. Definitely. Now we are going to have to start wrapping up, so I'll have to only ask another few questions, and then we'll yeah, get you out of here. I got a few minutes. Let's keep going. This is fun. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate your time. You've been great. Um, Aiden English, who you know mm -hmm. now he wrestled or now he does commentary for impact wrestling you worked with him what was it like working with him because here's a guy who kind of came out of nowhere on commentary he was always charismatic a really good mm -hmm. talker but he was yeah. primarily wrestling and then he made the switch and in my opinion it was a natural switch yeah definitely um matthew raywalt the drama king uh we've had a couple chances to work together 
since uh, our WWE days, which is really, it's always great to see him. Um, he's another one. Like I said, I, I think, I think Nigel McGuinness is the most criminally underrated commentator in wrestling. Not only was, is he, a, was he a legend in the ring? Uh, he is so good as a color commentator. And I think, I think Ray Walt is as well. I think, um, like you said, he's a natural, he, he's a natural performer. He's a, he's great at everything he did. I mean, he was as big a part of a Ru of Rusev day as, you know, Miro was in a way like, the catchphrase, yeah, the, the 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 singing. I mean, there's there's certain things that just come naturally, and that was so organic and natural. The way those two were able to command an entire fan base, that only happens once every couple of years. That Special is so talent. rare. Yeah, and so I I'm so happy that Impact was you know intelligent enough to to bring together Tom and Matt because you know Tom you can't find a better play-by-play -play guy in the game than Tom Hannafin. He, I learned so much. I learned so much from everyone on the team. They, once you're part of the team, everyone embraces you, yeah. you know, everyone from, from Tom to Ray Walt to Vic Joseph learned a lot from Vic. I'm very grateful to him too. Then you have the other parts of the team, whether it be, you know, Alicia Taylor, Caleb Braxton, uh, Mike Rome, Greg Hudson, Byron Saxton, everyone was just so kind and welcoming and they're always there to help. And I learned a ton from everybody, but yeah, I mean, impact is killing it. And, and Tom and Matt are such a professional team. Matt's a pros pro man. You, you put Ray Walt on commentary. You're always going to get top notch professional commentary. Cause the guy, he's an artist, man. He, he puts the work in, he wants to make sure he sounds great. And Tom is very much, Tom's also multi-talented. You know, Tom can call wrestling one day and guess what? He's talking about sports the next day. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I, th I think we both have a lot in common that way to where we want to be, we want to be great at a number of things. And so, you know, kudos to impact for, for having that team together. And um, you know, they're definitely fun to listen to. Definitely. And I think there, you brought up a lot of really high quality names from that period. And it might've been one of the best collections of, commentators and interviewers maybe ever in like one at one time because you had tom phillips michael cole yourself vic joseph uh i think alicia taylor was already starting um kayla braxton aiden english you know on and on and on and you had all these like high level commentators, especially play by play because it's often hard to find a good play by play commentator and it had like in my opinion some of the best that's been around in decades all yeah. at one time. It's a shame the pandemic and the budget cuts all happened and gutted a lot of the roster, but it was a great collection of talent. Now it really was. I mean, and you talk about Michael Cole. I love the fact that finally the fans on the internet are giving him the flowers or love, whatever you want to call it, that he deserves. And I, I also learned a ton from him. He was so what I love about working with Michael Cole, he's very upfront. He's a very busy man, doesn't have mm -hmm. a lot of time to BS around. He tells you how it is. He tells you what he you, you have to do. He tells you what he needs. Boom. And, you know, I really hit it off with him. And I learned so much um, from working with him. And, you know, there were some cool plans for me that if the pandemic didn't happen, you know, but it, and those plans were kind of from his mind. And I really did appreciate that. And I still do. And so I'm glad that fans are finally realizing how great he truly is and mm -hmm. the love he does have for the business and telling stories. And, um, and yeah, you mentioned Alicia, she was there a handful of months before I got there. So she kind of showed me the ropes in the beginning. And so right. I learned a ton from her when it came to doing live events. Cause you know, aside from play by play and interviews, I was also hosting live events for NXT around Florida on what the, the we call the coconut loop. And then I had just started doing some SmackDown tours uh, you know, I had a chance to do uh, Montreal, Toronto, and Los Angeles in a three-night run right before the new year of 2020. Ring announcing? Yes. Okay. And, oh, my gosh. I'll never forget. I, I got to stand in a jam-packed Staples Center right before the new year and host a live event. And the moments like that, yeah, you know, things were cut short, but when a worldwide pandemic happens, yes, it's devastating, but I'm grateful for every moment that I had because I am standing in front of Staples Center. Oh my God. I went there all the time living in Los Angeles. And now I'm in, I remember like I was, uh, 
I was ringside and I got a text from my buddy Rich, who's the general manager of the Comedy Magic Club. Very good friends with Gabriel Iglesias, right? Gabe owns his own private fancy studio suite in Staples Center, right? They're all up there. Rich is like, dude, we're in Gabe's suite right now. Gabe's losing his mind that you're inside the ring. I'm like, oh my God. You have moments like that, you, you know, that you'll never forget. Or the very first time I ever did play by play, there are certain moments where you feel like this was meant to be. It could have happened in any arena. It happened at the Wells Fargo Arena in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, the arena that I'd been going to for the past 15 years. Uh, it's where I watched the Royal Rumble in 2004. It's where I've gone to see shows. I went to college in West Philadelphia, 10 minutes from the arena. And the first broadcast I ever did for WWE was in that arena. You want to talk about being nervous that day. What a full circle moment. Wow. Yo, I couldn't eat. I remember uh, one of my closest friends in life, Evan Mack, who was part of the, the team on the bump. He was, they happened to be there that day for the arena. They were doing some stuff for the bump. And him, him and I were hanging out and catering. And he had never, him and I have an amazing chemistry. We used to host together for years. He had never seen me like this before. I, I, I couldn't talk. I didn't know what to say. I didn't really want to eat. <laughs> I was just like, because it was my first broadcast, but it was also in Philly and the Wells Fargo. Thank God it went great. But man, what an, ex so there's certain things that there are, I think there are amazing moments that are meant to be. And I think there are hard moments that were meant to be. I think the the moments like being in Philly, being at Staples Center, which is now crypto.com arena. I feel like those were meant to be. And, you know, maybe, you know, my time getting cut short was meant to be because if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't have the family that I have now. I wouldn't be also working in MMA, also in boxing. I wouldn't have a voiceover career. Um, there'd be a lot of things. So I don't know. I feel like it, it's hard. It's, you know, I, I haven't done any wrestling shows or wrestling podcasts. Cause I just, it, you know, I, I don't like giving my opinion on wrestling as mm -hmm. a play by play guy. I take play by play so seriously I don't like playing on Twitter. I don't like giving my opinion on wrestling. I don't like talking about wrestling. I let I let that stuff for other people. Mm -hmm. But to do a show like this, I thought it was a I thought it was a lot of fun. You, know, you the way you the way you asked me was so professional and you're like, "Yeah, it's just talk about wrestling and talk about your experiences." Like for me, that's that's what it's about. It's you know, if I don't ever do anything ever again in wrestling, I've done more than I ever could have imagined. I mean, I've been overseas. I've been to the Middle East for the troops. I mean, I, I helped organize a tour called the Ringside Salute Tour. We're going back again next year to where we got to visit the troops twice, um, going to Pakistan and, of course, working my dream job. So as much as I want to work in wrestling as much as possible, I would love to be on television again weekly. I think I'm ready for it, but doesn't mean it's going to happen. Yeah. And if it doesn't happen, I'm truly grateful for every second and every friend, every connection, every experience I've had, you know? So, um, yeah, that's kind of where it took a while to get to this mindset, but that's where I am now when I get a chance to really sit back and think about it. It's a super healthy mindset. And I do think that's a benefit that can come with shows like this is you can really sit back and reflect on your own career and people can have a new appreciation for the work that people put in and, I don't know. I think nostalgia is a very powerful tool. You know, you have the Conrad Thompson hosts the podcast, which basically they're all set around nostalgia. And I think nostalgia isn't just about, you know, 10, 20, 30 years ago. A year ago, if you can look back at something you did a year ago and maybe with a new set of eyes, think back and say, wow, that was pretty cool. That's great. That That's huge, I think. Absolutely. I mean, you, you think back to two years ago when the pandemic hit. Oh, my God. You talk about visceral and just how surreal things were. I remember Friday, March 6th, we had SmackDown TV in Buffalo and, you know, 205, of course. And I remember talking to Shane Helms, who's also a very good friend. We've been to the Middle East twice to visit the troops. Love Shane to death. Um, I said, hey, uh, do you want to drive to Niagara Falls after TV? Because we were starting to get the whispers of the pandemic and we didn't know what was going to happen. I was like, hey, you want to go to Niagara Falls after this? And he goes, all right. Like Shane, <laughs> Shane's always up for whatever, right? I had no idea where I was going. I just kept following signs to Niagara Falls. And I think we got to a point where Shane looked over at me 
And he can tell I had no idea where I was going, but he was just also like, all right, we'll see what happens. And we finally get across the border and we get to the point where it's weird. You don't know where the falls are. And all of a sudden, oh, there they are. And we just, I, there was nowhere to park. We just pulled over on the on the dirt road. We ran up to the falls. We took some photos. After about three minutes, he goes, it's cold. You ready to go? I'm like, yeah, let's go. And then we just left and drove back across because we wanted to have an experience because we didn't know what was going to happen. Sure enough, five days later, you know, they decided to move TV to the PC. And from the moment NXT went live at 8 p.m. Eastern to when it went off the air at 10, that two-hour window, how the world changed, is unbelievable. I mean, I remember during the broadcast, everyone's on their phones. Like, the Utah Jazz game got shut down. What? Yeah. And then all this other stuff happening. And we would always have, like, a little meeting after television every week, like a little announcer meeting, whoever was there. And I remember uh, I remember Tom saying, hey, uh, we don't know what's next, so just be on the lookout for a message. And sure enough, two days later, everything, you know, got shifted to the PC. And next thing we find out, you know, Ray Walt and I are going to call 205 Live in an empty PC. And we actually Crazy. shot that before SmackDown. So we actually, <clears throat> from what I understand, we got a chance to call the second ever empty arena event, uh, obviously behind The Rock and Mankind. <laughs> yeah. Even though it didn't air until after SmackDown, technically. But I'll never forget, like, as we were about to go on air, it was just such a surreal moment for for everybody. But him and I being at, like, I, the amount of pride I had in that moment, it's hard to explain. And obviously, we didn't want to... We didn't want to mention because we didn't know what the pandemic was at the time. We just said, I don't even remember what I said on air, but it's some to the extent of like, you know, um, in these very uncertain times, we just want to put smiles on your faces and do what we do best. And that is bring the action. Some to that extent, mm -hmm. like just glance on it. There's no people here. We have to reference it, but then let's move on. And uh, I believe that was when there were, we had like a five on five elimination match or, or something to that yeah, extent. Yeah, yeah. And then every week after that was leading up towards WrestleMania, which uh, I remember the, the the phrase was too big for just one night. And so, you know, we got to do that catchphrase and stuff like that. And just to, man, you talk about, I was there for a year, but how many changes happened in that one year is really unbelievable. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm, I'm proud of, I'm proud of everything everything I did there. And I'm truly grateful for every single moment. Yes. Did I, did I feel more moments were coming? Absolutely. But you know, worldwide pandemic pandemic happens, decisions get made. And unfortunately some decisions are not in your favor. All you can do is, you know, pick yourself back up and make yourself better. And I'm better now than I was two years ago. I can tell you that. And so I owe it, I owe it to having to adjust and having to go through changes to, see what you're really made out of, you know? And that's kind of where I'm at right now. But looking back on that, whew, so many surreal moments. Yeah. You know? Thank you for providing that insight because I do think <clears throat> the COVID and pandemic era of professional wrestling is going to be something that it's going to be talked about a lot. There's going to be a lot of documentaries, a lot of right. retrospectives. You know, right now people are, I mean, it's not gone, but it's obviously a lot better. There's less shutdowns than it was and all that. So I think there's, some people don't really want to look back yet, but I yeah. think in the future, there's going to be a lot of looking back and looking at it. And, you know, I remember there was some criticism because people were really interested in, you know, why won't they just talk about the pandemic on WWE TV? But right. I think the point is they want it to be an escape. They want, they yeah. don't, first of all, they don't <laughs> know what's going on any more than anybody else does. So it's not like you can provide a lot of information, but you just want to say, Hey, the world is crazy. People are scared. Enjoy two hours of wrestling. Enjoy 45 minutes of wrestling. Enjoy this show. Yeah, it, it had to be an escape. Um, and, and the entire team, gosh, it, it's amazing how television was able to keep happening. You had people who, you know, obviously were away from their families who were still coming to work every single day. And yeah, that was the whole point. It truly did have to be an escape. And people can say what they want about the people up top and the people making decisions. When it comes down to it, being a part of that team truly was about making fans happy and putting smiles on faces. 
whether it was in an empty arena during the pandemic or it was in front of live audiences. <clears throat> I'll never forget another one of my favorite moments. Didn't happen on camera. It didn't happen on a microphone. Uh, I was doing a live event for SmackDown somewhere in New York, I believe, <clears throat> early March of uh, 2020. And uh, not early March. I want to say maybe a month earlier. And I was going to do a live hit from the crowd. Like we're going to do like a little giveaway at some point. And I was out in this one little section of the crowd. And it was about five minutes before we were going to go live. And there's a little four-year-old girl just bawling her eyes out. And I was just like, you know, me, I, I love kids. You know, I, I grew up as being a physical therapist working in pediatrics for a while. Like I just, you know, I want to make kids happy. So this little girl's crying. Her parents are trying to get her to stop crying. I said, what's going on? And her mom goes, she thinks the fiend is going to come out and get her. I'm like, oh, because, you know, oh, the man. yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's great. And I remember telling her, I go, hey, do you want to feel better? She's like, yeah. I said, here's the thing. The fiend has a lot of powers, but the one power he doesn't have is coming this far out to the crowd. I said, so even if the fiend shows up tonight, he's not able to come out here. So you have nothing to worry about. Even if you see the fiend, he can't come out here. And by the time I got done talking to her, she was smiling again. It was the greatest. Like, I felt so proud of myself. I'm like, oh, my God. I, I turned a kid from crying into making her happy again. And then we did the live hit. But the coolest part about that is the 25, 30 people sitting around that got to watch that. They're like, oh, my God, this guy is a pro. He knows. Yeah. <laughs> and, like, look, just little moments like that where I would never turn it off. Like, if I would do my live hit and then, the you know, the camera would go away, I would make sure I high five and fist bump every single kid in the aisle or the front row. Cause I think back to me being a little kid at the Allentown fairgrounds and just seeing all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I remember one of the producers telling me one night, he goes, you know what you, what stands out about you, this isn't just a job to you. He's like, I can, he's like, I've worked with a lot of people. I can tell how much you love this job because you're just not doing your job. And then going backstage, you're high-fiving kids. You're saying hello. <clears throat> you're talking to them. Passion. And for me, it wasn't that I felt like I had to. It's just that's what I want to do. Like I, putting smiles on faces is what it's all about. To this day, any wrestling event I do, hell yeah, I'm going to talk to the kids. I'm going to make them laugh. I want to give them an experience that maybe they'll remember years to come. And so I always was cognizant of that. Every live event I did, whether it be a little coconut loop show in front of 200 people or a live event in front of 10,000 people. I loved the interaction with families and their kids. Cause at the end of the day, that's what pro wrestling should be. You want to see families there. You want to see 80 year old ladies. You want to see five-year-old kids and you want to see parents that are proud that they spent their money to bring their kids. And if, you know, if, if it meant giving a high five or giving a fist bump or talking to a little kid, I made sure I did that. And it just, it wasn't something that I felt like I had to do. It's just something that I wanted to do because I thought about myself when I was a little kid and what that would mean to me. So um, that's I think that's probably what I'm most proud of is like, yeah, the stuff on camera. Sure, that means a lot. I can go back and watch it and, you know, be grateful for it. But it's the moments that you have with with the fans or like being able to hook a friend up with tickets and him and his eight year old son got to sit front row at an NXT live event in New York. Um, he still thanks me to this day. I didn't even do anything. I just said, hey. Can my friend have tickets? Didn't know they were going to give him front row seats, but they yeah. did. But it's like moments like that, man. Like life is tough. If you can make someone's life a little bit better just by being kind, I think you got to do it. And that that's that's the thing that pro wrestling, that's why I love it so much. Is there, there's, yes, there's a lot of negativity on the internet and this company versus that company. At the end of the day, make people happy. You know what I mean? Tell stories, make people happy, do whatever you can do in your power to make people smile. And that's, that's what it's all about. Make memories last a lifetime. Right. Now we'll get to plugs in just a second, but before we do, I wanted to ask, you know, you brought up, you've, you're doing a lot, a whole lot these days. What do you think of Triple H's vision for wrestling from what you've seen and from the conversations you've had as limited as they may have been? <clears throat> and do you think you could ever see yourself potentially returning there in the future? Again, obviously, I know you have a lot going on these days, but, you know, a never say never kind of thing, possibly. Sure. Oh, you can never say re never in wrestling. You know that much. <laughs> um, no, I mean, look, 
the the proof is in the pudding. You look at, and obviously I don't get a chance to to watch everything insanely closely like I I used to. But at the same time, you see all the changes that have been made. They've all been phenomenal changes. And you look at how many. I'm so glad to see so many friends and colleagues getting their jobs back because they deserve it. And so I think all the changes have truly been amazing, you know, and um, it's exciting to see what the future is going to hold. And yeah, of course you can never say never. I mean, uh, like I said, there was, there's no, there was never any bad terms. There was never any, you know, issues with me making mistakes. It was nothing like that. It's just the worldwide pandemic happened and numbers got cut. <laughs> it's as simple as that. Yeah. And so of course I'd be interested. Uh, I love wrestling, man. Like, it's my f- absolute favorite thing in life. Like as yeah, I love stand up. I love professional wrestling more. Um, I love play by play. That's what I, that's my favorite thing. I want to do that as much as possible. I love being in front of an audience. I love making people smile. I love making people laugh. And so, yeah, of course, if uh, if if any opportunity comes up, absolutely, I'd be interested uh, with them or another company. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel like I'm better now than I've ever been before. And you ask anyone who's ever worked with me, I bring a lot to the table. It's just a matter of uh, staying sharp and, you know, putting good energy out there. And and I truly believe that that good karma will come your way and uh, the right opportunities will present themselves. And, you know, a lot of opportunities probably will. I mean, Triple H has gone on record and he's talked about global localization, which I think is huge. I think that's going to be a big thing. You know, NXT Japan, NXT Europe, NXT Australia. You know, you have all of these different developmental territories with local television and then expansions in the United States. And then, you know, he's big on like tournaments like the Mae Young Classic and the Cruiserweight Classic. And you can't do all that with the same three, four commentators. It's just not possible. So opportunities will probably exist. Either way, you're doing a fantastic job with everything you're doing, and you were a fantastic guest today, and I appreciate so much. Uh, thank you for being so generous with your time. I know we went over. Do you mind hitting some plugs again just so people know where to follow you and check you out? Yeah, of course. And thank you. This was a lot of fun, man. Just just talking wrestling and telling stories is a beautiful thing, and so I'm, I'm glad you wanted to have me on. Uh, yeah, once again, real simple, Jay Quasto on all social media platforms. If you want to watch my special, go to quastospecial.com. Uh, you can check it out there for free on Roku, on Tubi, the whole deal. My dry bar special should be coming out soon. And if you love MMA, I strongly urge you, uh, if you have UFC Fight Pass, which is awesome. UFC Fight Pass is like their own version of Netflix. It's so cool. Uh, Titan FC, every single pay-per-view we have is on UFC Fight Pass. You could watch it live. You could watch it on demand. The next one coming up will be Friday, December 11th. That's Titan FC 81. But go back and watch Titan FC 80. We had two title fights, both phenomenal title fights. We had one new champion crowned, one retained, a lot of fun. And so I'm I'm so grateful to be in the Titan FC family because uh, they also do a lot of great work for charity. Uh, the owner, Lex McMahon, uh, Lex McMahon, no relation to Vince, actually the son of Ed McMahon, if you could believe that. Um, wow. He's Yeah, he's raising money right now. He's a veteran himself. He's raising money for a herousa.org, which helps prevent veteran suicide. And one of the biggest things we're doing for December 11th is we're trying to raise as much money as possible for a hero USA. Lex being 51 years old is actually going into the cage to fight. He's been training. He's had a couple of professional fights, but he's going in there to raise money uh, for veterans. And it's an amazing cause. So to, to be a part of the Titan FC family, it's it's a true honor, and I'm I'm doing my best to raise money for them as well. And so, uh, I strongly urge you to check it out on UFC Fight Pass for sure. Cool, thank you so much again. Great interview. This one even better. I had high hopes, and this one better than I expected. So, thank you for your time, guys. Also, be sure to subscribe on YouTube. Also, Our- make sure you're watching Championship Wrestling every single week for free. If you want to find out how, just hit me up on social media. I'll send you a link. You can hit the subscribe button. And guess what? You get those alerts that the technology allows you to have, and you can watch it every week. I'm telling you, it's amazing. Absolutely. So, you know, follow them. Follow them on Twitter as well and social media, just so you're always in the know. Follow him and then follow us at Armbar Sidebar on Twitter, at Armbars and Sidebars on Instagram, and subscribe on YouTube. Thank you so much, Johnny, for a wonderful interview. And until next time, guys, later.